Yep, that title is true. And I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of how I've passed this massive milestone in my business. Um, and it was a perfect time to reflect on this and share the story with you and also follow up on last week's video where I talked about the importance of testing and failing and risking and being very imperfect in this very perfect social media world. And I heard a story that kind of changed my whole perspective on all of this. And I used to have all of these post-its on my on my mirror in my room uh, where it would say things like revenue goals that I wanted to hit and, um, you know, social media metrics I wanted to hit and all these things. And when I heard this story, I took them all down and I replaced it with just this test, fail, learn, grow, repeat, test, fail, learn, grow, repeat. And the story, ironically, is from the founder of Post-its. So I don't know if you know this story, but it's really interesting. So Post-its weren't really ever supposed to be a thing. It actually started as an adhesive that was meant to be used in aerospace. And it was considered a pretty epic failure when the guy created the, the adhesive and it was very weak and really couldn't hold much together. And that's how Post-its eventually came to be. And it's brilliant. But it was 14 years from the time of that failure, the aerospace failure with the glue that didn't actually stick to anything, <laughs> to Post-its being created. Create it, which I think is a really valuable lesson in the amount of time that it can take for an idea to actually come to life and all the failures along the way that sometimes are required to get there. So for me, I mean, Post-its now are doing 50 billion, uh, I believe it's 50 billion units a year uh, are being produced, uh, which is a crazy number, but $10 million is a crazy number for me. I never would have anticipated this. I never would have seen this coming four years ago. And I've had so many failures along the way. And I think as much as it's important to celebrate your wins and talk about what you're really proud of, I think it's really important to share the actual honest journey of how I got here. Because I know it's going to be helpful, helpful for you. And I don't know that it's often talked about enough. Um, so the numbers, just to break it down, I don't remember the exact dollars and cents, so I'll pull that up somewhere on the screen, but um, the breakdown of how we got here. So we have two products. Um, we have YouTube for Bosses, which is a self-study course. Maybe you're in it. Um, and it is for anybody who wants to grow on YouTube. And then we have the Authority Accelerator, which is our consulting program and we help people build an online course business from the ground up and scale it organically to elevate their impact, income, and authority online. So those are the two core pieces of our business. YouTube for Bosses launched four years ago and that's when this iteration of my business really started. So in those four years, in 2016, we did 457,000. In 2017, we did 1.3 million. In 2018, we did 2.7 million and in 20 19 to 2020, which is now, we did 5.4 million. It's really crazy to say that out loud. <laughs> like, that's so nuts. Um, it's still sinking in for me. And that another that's another reason I wanted to share this because anything is possible if you just keep moving forward. Um, so I wanted to share my most epic failures. <laughs> my top four because there were too many to actually count um, in hopes that it'll be helpful to you wherever you are on your journey. So the first one, this is, this is not what I went to school for. Um, I did not go to school to become a YouTuber. YouTubers weren't even really a thing when I was in school. Um, I went to school and much to my parents' chagrin, I actually was supposed to go to this really prestigious university and the week before I was supposed to start, I decided I didn't want to go because it was going to take me too long to get to where I wanted to be, which was I wanted to be a journalist. So I ended up going to a technical school and I ended up going to journalism school. I graduated early and I got my first job in radio. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have made it. I was making $26,500. Um, that was my salary and I felt rich. I was like, that this is it. This is the most amazing thing ever. I've got my dream job. I'm gonna work in radio. This is all I've ever wanted. I wanna be Oprah. Oprah started in radio, we're good. Um, and so I did that job and it evolved and I ended up working in television and then I landed my dream job at the Olympics in 2010. And it was the pinnacle of what I was trying to achieve. And I get there and it doesn't feel right. And I'm like, this is not, this is not what I thought it was gonna be. 
I'm being told, you know, what to say, what to wear, what to cover. And the whole reason I wanted to be a journalist and get into media was to tell stories, inspire people, help people, um, connect people. And it just wasn't really panning out like that. And I'm also very impatient. So, <laughs> so I was like, this isn't for me. So I left the Olympics. Um, finished my work and everything and it was an amazing experience because it was such an epic time in our country and in Canada That's where I live um, But it just wasn't my dream job. So I was really disappointed. I felt like a failure I didn't really want to tell my friends or my family and I was like, what can I do instead? I said, oh, I can be my own journalist. So my very first business I decided to start an online magazine and the online magazine was Who knows where this idea came from but it was an online magazine written for men by women. So it's kind of like a Cosmo, but for men. And brand wise, it was great. I built up this brand. I built up a following on social media and social media really wasn't a thing at this time. No one was really using it for business, but I didn't have money to be spending on ads and all these things and billboards and trying to get the word out there. So I was like, what can I do? Okay. I'm going to turn to Facebook and Twitter um, and YouTube at the time. And figure this out on my own. So it was basically this huge testing ground and I figured out how to use the algorithms. I figured out how to, out how to use social media. The business made a whopping $500. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I actually don't remember the exact amount of money that this business pulled in, but it wasn't much. And I, the only reason I remember the $500 is because I was actually going door to door in Vancouver finding people to advertise on the site. Um, I was knocking on doors and this really, the business still exists. It was this um, men's skincare um, store and they were like, sure, we'll advertise. And they paid me $500. And again, it was such a huge win and I felt rich. The money meant nothing to me. I was just like, I did it. I made a sale and I'd been turned down so much and I honestly, this is going to sound so silly, but I didn't really realize the value and the importance of understanding the art of selling and selling always felt gross and icky to me and like something I was never going to be good at. And then I realized that if you have something that is going to be helpful to people, selling is actually a huge act of generosity. So from that business, my biggest thing was I learned social media. I learned how to sell through social media and I learned how to sell in general and be confident about it and know that I had something good and helpful to offer. So I built up the brand. I don't really have a great monetization strategy for this business at all, <laughs> clearly. And I start getting noticed by all of these people because of what I'm doing with the social media and that I'm building this audience for free on these social platforms. And so companies start reaching out to me and they're asking me, how can you help me and my business? And I start taking on clients and I build this little consultancy. And over the next four years, I just become obsessed with social media. I don't have a brand. I don't have a following. I don't care to have one. That's not even really a thing at this time. Um, I just want to learn this inside now because I can see how powerful of a tool it is to engage and connect and do all the things that I wanted to do as a journalist. And so I hone my skill sets. I'm getting lots of clients, but I'm a one woman show and I really don't want to grow at this point. I don't want to have a team. I want to be a solopreneur. I want to travel the world. I want to do all these things. So I do that, but at a certain point I hit a ceiling and maybe you can relate to that. And I couldn't take on more clients. So I decided how can I get around this? How can I not have to hire a team, but also help my clients um, and maintain my roster of clients. And so I decided I would go to YouTube. At the time on my YouTube channel, I had like, family videos, some random vlogs that I attempted to make, all of these random things, um, but no strategy, nothing, and barely any subscribers. And I just decided to post a video to answer one of my client questions um, because a few of my clients at the time were asking about it and they were asking about live streaming on Periscope. Um, and so I decided to make a tutorial about it. And I didn't put any effort into it really outside of I wanted to just really portray and help the clients. So they wouldn't ask me more questions to be totally honest. So I made the video. And lo and behold, the next day, it's got a lot of views. Shocking to me because I don't understand. I don't really have any subscribers. Where are the views coming from? But I realized I was the first person to make a video on the topic. And it was a topic that was being highly searched because it was a new tool. And so I started getting all these inquiries of people wanting to work with me and hire me for social media expertise. And I'm already at a limit with my clients. So now I have to figure out how can I help more people when I'm a one person show. And so after that 
thing happened where I was getting all of these emails and requests and speaking engagements and all these things started flooding in because of YouTube. And truthfully, I was awful at YouTube. <laughs> when I first started, I was awful at YouTube. You can go back to my oldest videos. I did not know what the hell I was doing. And so I got better and better. And because I was so bad at it, but I knew that it had such potential because of that first video I made, that's how I developed the Sunny system. And the Sunny system has now been used by thousands of people all over the world. We've got 8,000 clients that have used the Sunny system to grow their businesses and grow their brands using YouTube. And the only reason I created it was because I was so freaking bad at it and I failed at it the first time around and I really wanted to crack the code. And so, I start building up my YouTube channel. I start building up that business and it's bringing in so much demand that out of pure necessity, and this is, if you can take one thing from this, do not do anything in your business out of boredom. Do anything that you can in your business out of absolute necessity. If it is not 100% necessary, you're just bored and you have shiny object syndrome. And I have been guilty of that. So every move that I have made that has actually made a huge difference in my business has been born out of pure necessity. So I get all this demand from YouTube and I discover the idea of online courses. And I realize, oh, you can actually package your expertise into an online course. And that would help me reach more people without actually doing the one-on-one -on -one work. And so I decide, okay, I'm gonna package my knowledge and I'm gonna create a course. My first course, I wouldn't call it an epic failure, but I didn't know how to create the best possible course at the time. So it did okay, but it wasn't amazing. Um, and I had a couple other ones in between there until I landed on YouTube for Bosses. And YouTube for Bosses, as I said, has been around for four years and we have served people all over the world. Um, and it's really incredible to see the results that people have. We have this 100K club with all these people who have achieved 100,000 subscribers and more and people making $100,000 in revenue per month from their channels um, and more. It's, it's amazing. But that wouldn't have happened unless I had had those previous failures. And then from there, my team starts to grow. And the, the sort of pressure starts to grow because then it's like a real business. It's not just me anymore. And I have all this demand and these clients and all these things um, and we're building the course and the course is doing super well and I just start to feel like I have to be perfect all the time in order to maintain this. And then I try and get the fanciest equipment when it comes to YouTube and I'm feeling like I need a big new set and all these fancy things to really be worthy of the success that I'm getting. And that for me was a massive mindset shift and it led to burnout for me. I was trying to do too much. And just having the course, I felt like, okay, this is almost like too easy. I should have other options in my business. And I started doing customized work for people, which was the worst because I was just constantly reinventing the wheel when I had a strategy that worked. And so I was doing one-on-one. -on -one. We built an agency at one point. The team grew. It was a lot. It was a lot at once. And I ended up in the hospital with burnout. Now I'm hesitant to call this a failure, but it is. And it's still a sore subject for me because I still carry some embarrassment about it, which is silly. And I know that I don't need to be embarrassed about it, but it's frustrating to me that I ended up here. And I guess if I could help you with one thing, like don't end up here, there's an easier way to do it. But the whole blessing out of this burnout and this failure is I was forced it was 100% necessary to be able to figure out a business model that wasn't going to run me into the ground, that worked with my life, not against my life. And that's honestly where the beginnings of the Authority Accelerator program started. And now with the Authority Accelerator program, we officially launched it not that long ago, uh, over a year ago now, but not that long ago. And we have close to a thousand clients in that program now. And it is game changing. Our clients are reaching 100K months. They're uh, scaling their businesses from zero. They are doing it organically. One of our clients just put a down payment on her first home. The results in that are incredible. The most beautiful part of it to me is that our clients always say that it's a system and it's a method. And I never would have created, we call it the rocket method, for business owners if I hadn't gone through that burnout because I hit that low point and realized there was a different way to do it. And that failure 
out of pure necessity, created this incredibly powerful methodology to help people build their businesses with less hustle and more flow. And like I said, the results speak for themselves. Um, and so all of those four epic failures have taught me so much and it's it's how these businesses came to be. It's how we've reached a point where we've done $10 million in revenue, which is still, again, really strange to say out loud and still doesn't even feel like it's a real thing because I am so committed to failure. I remember this quote from when I was um, growing up watching Oprah, I heard her say it and she said, think like a queen, a queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is a stepping stone on the way to greatness. And it still like gets to me because, oh, I never would have anticipated I'd be here. And I feel so fortunate that I am, but I also look back at this journey and I'm like, it, it has not been easy. I hope you don't ever think it is easy. I hope I don't make it look easy. <laughs> um, it's hard, but it's so worth it because I know the impact that I'm having is going to long outlast me. And that's why we call it a legacy business and we help our clients build, build legacy businesses. So your impact was on a long, long time. And even now, and I want to address this because I've seen some comments, etc. My channel has shifted and there could be seen as like a perceived failure because I'm not talking about a lot of the things that I used to talk about in the way that I used to talk about them. I've gotten more personal with you. I'm sharing more of my inner workings and behind the scenes and the values that I hold true to myself. And if you look at my channel recently, you could say, wow, her videos aren't doing so well. And you could technically say that, you know, low views are a failure. And I look at it as feedback. And I look at failure as something that fuels me. And I, I seek it out. Because if I'm failing, I'm doing something. And I'm doing something different. And I'm challenging myself. And the minute I stop challenging myself or thinking in a day one mindset, which Jeff, Jeff Bezos talks about a lot, he wants it to be day one mentality always. Because when you're in your day one mentality, when you're just starting your business, you're at your scrappiest and you will figure it out. Regardless of what you have, if you have no money at all, you'll figure it out. You'll figure out how to make that money. You'll figure it out how to do it in a way that's efficient and cost friendly. And I think that's such a great mindset to constantly be in. So. If you look at my channel and you're like, oh, I'm kind of low views lately, you may look at it as I'm failing. I look at it as I have found my core audience. I am listening. I have connected with you in a deeper way than I ever thought I would. And I know this is a stepping stone on the way to greatness. So I want you to understand that and I want you to celebrate your failures. What are your most epic fails? Even recently, today, if you had one, I have them every day. Listen, I didn't have time to talk about all my failures, but I fail every single day and that to me tells me I'm growing. So put them in the comments below. Let's have a fail fest. <laughs> Cause I think that would be a really fun thing to do and to just make it normalize that imperfection is good. Failing is good. Testing is good. Testing creates growth. Testing creates new inventions. And let's face it this year, has tested us. And I'm so excited to see what comes out of it because there are gonna be some amazing businesses and amazing disruptions that come out of this year. There already have been. So with every failure and with every loss and with every perceived setback, I really do look at these failures and I really do believe that each one of them ultimately leads you to your next win. Are you with me? If you are, I have a free secret group for people who are committed to showing up as themselves and testing their way to their goals. Click the link below to join and watch these videos next. And don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.